Okay, well, let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the third installment of WWP's winter webinar series. I will acknowledge that we are now through the winter months, so happy spring, everybody. My name is Adam Bronstein, and I am the Oregon, Nevada Director with Western Watersheds Project. I am your host for this evening. I am presenting from my home in Central Oregon, the traditional lands of the Tenino and the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs, Siletz, and Grand Ronde. This evening's webinar is on a most important topic, domestic livestock grazing in federally designated wilderness. How did this come to pass? I thought wilderness was supposed to be untrammeled and wild. We will discuss this great contradiction and much more with our panelists this evening. Stay tuned for WWP's next webinar event, which we will be covering the epidemic of the Bureau of Land Management's failing rangeland health standards on grazing allotments across the West with the fine folks from the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility on their recent bombshell analysis. Before we jump into our presentations, I'm gonna share a map with all of you to show the current extent of livestock grazing in our wilderness areas. So if you just give me one second here, I'll share my screen. Okay, I assume everyone can see that. So we'll just take a quick cruise around so up here in Washington, it's pretty light. Oregon, the Central Cascades are fairly clear down by the Steens Mountains. Uh, Steens Mountain, we have uh, some grazing allotments. Nevada is just a big old mess. And you also have to keep in mind that there's a lot of WSAs, wilderness study areas here too, that we're not even speaking on tonight. Uh, all throughout the uh, Harney Basin in Nevada, uh, Southern um, Idaho, Let's see in the Oahe country, we have uh, quite a bit of wilderness that's grazed very heavily. California, the High Sierra looks pretty good, but still some issues here. Uh, the uh, Death Valley area is quite dry. And then uh, Arizona, New Mexico, um, Colorado, Utah, we have some problems here. Cindy will be speaking on uh, Arizona tonight. And then up in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the Wind River Range, got some problems here. The Papoja, Fitzpatrick Wilderness, the uh, Teton Wilderness here in the Absorcas. And up in Montana, it's looking pretty good, but we have some WSAs here as well with some issues. So I'm going to stop my screen share. All right. And uh, before we jump into the presentations here, uh, let's just go over the Q&A process. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them into the chat. And our Idaho director, Patrick Kelly, will be answering, will be asking those on behalf of you to our panelists. So first up, we have Dana Johnson, who's the staff attorney with Wilderness Watch. Her presentation title is Grazing in Wilderness, the Legal Landscape and Implications on the Ground. Over to you, Dana. Thank you. Give me just a second here. I'll see if I can get my screen up. Okay, does that look okay from your end? Looks good. Great. All right, I am Dana Johnson. I'm staff attorney for Wilderness Watch. Um, and my role in the presentation today will be to provide a zoomed out view of grazing in the National Wilderness Preservation System, uh, including what that looks like on the ground um, and what the legal landscape looks like. And due to time, of course, I'll just barely be scratching the surface. So I'll provide a couple of links at the end um, with additional information if anybody's interested. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in here. So this map is not quite as good as the one that you just saw, um, but this gives you a visual of the lands that are at issue. There are over 111 million acres of land protected in the National Wilderness Preservation System. Uh, about half of that acreage is found in Alaska, and there is no authorized grazing in wilderness in Alaska. So in the lower 48, what we're looking at is um, land mostly west of the Mississippi. And we're gonna be focusing primarily on wilderness areas that are administered by 
the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, uh, because that's where the vast majority of grazing and wilderness occurs. And so on this map, those areas are delineated in the green and the yellow areas. And here's a slightly better view uh, of that. Uh, these are the wilderness areas at issue. It's a little bit hard to see on this map too, but there are roughly 600 individual wilderness areas in view here. And grazing occurs on over 300 of those and in all um, of the 11 Western states. So from what you're looking at here, that's roughly 50 million acres of wilderness um, and about 13 million acres of those are allotted for domestic um, livestock grazing. And so just to put these numbers in the context of what that looks like within the broader landscape um, of livestock grazing nationwide, there are approximately 530,000 animal unit months or AUMs in wilderness. And there are a total of 15.6 million AUMs um, grazed annually on BLM and Forest Service land nationwide. And so an AUM is basically um, how they, they consider those as a mature cow and her calf uh, or five sheep um, grazing for one month. So it's the forage available to feed those animals. So wilderness, we're looking at 530,000 as opposed to 15.6 million nationwide. So um, wilderness uh, has fairly small impact, impact on the livestock industry nationwide but uh, grazing in wilderness is incredibly detrimental to wilderness character from targeted killings of predators, um, conflict with wildlife, degradation of streams, um, water depletion, developments, motorized access, invasive species, um, the risks per, or the risks posed to, um, sorry about that, I just had something pop up on the middle of my screen here. Let me get rid of that. There we go. So the livestock grazing prevents significant harm to wilderness and it provides relatively little utility to the livestock industry. Does that still look okay from your end, everybody? Okay. Looks good. So moving forward here, sorry about that. Fighting with Zoom again. I seem to have lost a cursor and cannot get the screen to progress here. Bear with me for just a second. You might try your over arrows. There we go. Okay. So to provide another visual of what this looks like on the ground, uh, this chart breaks down wilderness grazing by state. And you can see from looking at this that the most grazing in wilderness um, occurs in Nevada, uh, Arizona, California, and Colorado. Um, and you'll notice here on this chart that there's a distinction between allotted acres, uh, which total about 13 million acres, and grazed acres, which total about 10 million acres. And this is because each of these allotments may not be grazed every year for a variety of reasons. It might be from um, non-use uh, voluntarily from the permittee. It might be because of drought. It might be because the allotment is vacant. And vacant allotments are important in wilderness because these are allotments that are not permitted to any individual. Um, so there's no permitted issue. And they are eligible under current management schemes to be open again to grazing in the future. And so a lot of these allotments have been vacant for decades and have recovered substantially from prior grazing. And so we'd really like to see a lot of these areas closed um, permanently in the, to future grazing. And each of my co-panelists are gonna talk a little bit more about specific um, wilderness areas today. Uh, but before we get there, assuming my slides will work for me, um, I'm gonna give kind of a, a brief overview of the legal landscape that we're looking at. Because uh, a lot of people are surprised to hear that there's any grazing and wilderness at all. So let's take a look at where that comes from. The Wilderness Act was passed in 1964 
uh, to assure that an increasing population with all of its technological advancements and mechanization didn't occupy and modify all lands, leaving no areas for protection in their natural condition. And most man land management statutes, um, as a lot of you probably know, are multiple use statutes. Uh, they have multiple use mandates where the administering agency, whether it be the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, uh, has to balance various competing uses of the land. And a lot of those are extractive and consumptive and commercialized. So unlike those multiple use statutes, the Wilderness Act's prim primary purpose is the preservation of wilderness character. And you can see here that the Wilderness, or the wilderness Act defines wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his own works dominate the landscape. And it also defines it as an area where earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man and where natural processes are left to dictate the conditions on the ground. So, in order to preserve wilderness character, the Wilderness Act prohibited things like commercial enterprise, um, roads, whether they're temporary or permanent roads, motorized equipment, aircraft, and structures. And interestingly, the first draft of the Wilderness Act back in 1956 also prohibited grazing in wilderness. Uh, grazing is a commercial enterprise. It's often associated with roads and development and predator control efforts. Um, and as we increasingly saw over the years uh, since the passage of the Wilderness Act, it's also associated with a lot of motorized access um, and heavy equipment use uh, to maintain all of the developments that are associated with grazing. But uh, nonetheless, as we all are aware, uh, the livestock industry has a lot of political sway and the provision prohibiting grazing was removed from the final version of the Wilderness Act. So uh, what we ended up with instead was a special provision in the Wilderness Act that expressly allowed the continuation of grazing. Uh, and this is what it said. Grazing of livestock were established prior to 1964 shall be permitted to continue subject to reasonable regulations as are deemed necessary by the Secretary of Agriculture. And that's it. That's all that's in the Wilderness Act. Um, it didn't address how this special provision interacts with the prohibition on motorized use or the prohibition on structures. And the Secretary of Agriculture never created the referenced um, reasonable regulations. And so as you can probably imagine, this left a lot of room for confused agency interpretation. Um, and back in 1964, that wasn't um, quite as big of a deal as it is now. Um, the areas that were designated by the Wilderness Act in 1964, uh, approximately 54 wilderness areas, did not have a lot of grazing in them. And where grazing was occurring, it was not, not associated with a lot of motorized use. Uh, that all changed in the 70s uh, when Congress passed the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, or FLIPMA, um, which allowed uh, the creation of BLM-administered wildernesses, which was something new. Prior to that, it was primarily Forest Service. Um, and another thing that occurred in the 70s um, was the Forest Service's Rare Two Inventory, which identified a lot of potential wilderness um, to be designated. And so all of that spurred a lot of pushback from the livestock industry. Uh, they argued that new wilderness designation would impede grazing um, because it would preclude a lot of the grazing related activities that they rely upon, such as motorized use and the creation of developments in a lot of these areas. And so fast forward to 1980 and we get the congressional grazing guidelines. Um, and unfortunately, because of time today, I don't have time to dive too deeply into these, but they're really important for understanding what's going on with um, grazing and wilderness. They're at the forefront of a lot of our litigation uh, regarding grazing and wilderness. And in my opinion, they represent one of the biggest practical hurdles to protecting wilderness from grazing. Um, and part of the problem that I'll talk a little bit about is how the agencies are interpreting the current guidelines. So um, let's take a quick look at what they are. The, this is just an excerpt um, of the guidelines that kind of highlights some of the most important features. Um, and the guidelines laid out five um, clarifications on what Congress meant by grazing um, continuing in wilderness. 
And so the first of those was that there would be no um, curtailments of grazing and wilderness simply because an area is or has been designated as wilderness. So um, the next phrase gives a little bit of clarification to that. Any adjustments in the numbers of livestock should be made as a result of the normal land management planning process. So any reason that you can reduce grazing outside of wilderness, um, say for conflicts with wildlife or not meeting range standards, you can use those same things to reduce grazing in wilderness. It just can't be solely because the area has been designated as wilderness. Um, the other feature here in the, the first um, section of the grazing guidelines is that there was an assumption that the numbers of livestock permitted to graze um, would remain at the approximate levels existing at the time that the area was designated as wilderness. Um, and I'll give you an example of how that um, is being abused by the agencies in just a second. But the grazing guidelines also address facilities um, and structures in wilderness, when those can be maintained, um, when motorized use can um, occur, and it's only where practical alternatives do not exist, um, and where that motorized use had occurred before the area was designated as wilderness. Um, it allows new improvements, but only for res resource protection, so not for increasing grazing numbers or increasing ease of grazing. And they assumed that motorized equipment other than um, for uh, maintaining support facilities would be for emergency use only. Um, so rescuing sick animals, um, dropping emergency feed and that it should not be abused by the permittees. So um, I have a couple of examples to share of the, how that went wrong <laughs> um, and what we've been seeing with the agencies. Um, in the Owyhee region, uh, the BLM issued this authorization. Uh, the permittee has authorized the use of an ATV within the Little Jacks Creek wilderness to herd livestock between pastures. ATV use is restricted to herding livestock between pastures and routinely checking livestock, um, which is not much of a restriction at all. That pretty much covers most of the grazing related activities. And if I go back here, um, it has motorized use uh, is only allowed where practical alternatives do not exist, um, where motorized use had occurred prior to the area's designation as wilderness, which was not the case um, in that example that I just gave you. Uh, and that was definitely not for an emergency. Um, let me give you another example here. This one came out of Colorado, uh, the BLM uh, there as well. Um, authorized motorized vehicles to perform animal husbandry activities such as placing large quantities of salt, checking on livestock in order to detect emergencies, or hauling camping supplies into the Blue or Black Ridge Canyons wilderness. And in this case, um, the authorization by the BLM also substantially increased the number of animals that were allowed to graze in this particular wilderness. And back when this wilderness was entered into the wilderness system, um, which was the operative time period for assessing how many animals can graze in the area, the AUM, A, AUMs grazed on the two allotments at issue was zero. Um, but the BLM in this case authorized over 800 AUMs in one of the wildernesses and over 300 in the other. So it was a substantial increase from what was occurring at the time of designation. And uh, lastly, in the Gila uh, bioregion, the Forest Service, as you can see, authorized substantial development and grazing um, over a 10 year period and over a huge um, region in this area. Most of the development here um, occurred outside of wilderness or will occur outside of wilderness, but a significant portion is within the Blue Range Primitive Area, which is um, managed as wilderness. And the increase in cows, so it authorized nearly 4,000 cows or horses um, over 10 years, occurs in the Gila and the Blue Range Wilderness areas. Um, and this is an area that has a chronic um, history of grazing permit violations, of trespass cows, um, of predator killing uh, to protect livestock, including the killing of ESA listed Mexican wolves. So it's a, uh, got a long history of abuses um, of grazing in this area. And Wilderness Watch and Western Watersheds Project 
are challenging this decision and many of the other decisions through the appeals and litigation process. Um, but we're also looking at some other things that we can do um, to rein in wilderness or rein in grazing and wilderness. And these are a few of those solutions. Um, the first is something that I've already talked about just a little bit, and that's the vacant um, allotment closures. So as I mentioned, there are 3 million acres of wilderness currently um, sitting there vacant. They have no permittee associated with the allotment. Um, they are at risk of being grazed again in the future. And um, these areas could be closed either through a legislative process or through the agency's planning process. Uh, another option is voluntary grazing permit retirement. Um, this is where a permit holder could voluntarily relinquish um, their permit through various incentives and the agencies could permanently close those allotments. Um, the Voluntary Grazing Permit Retirement Act, which some of you have probably heard about, um, is one piece of existing legislation that would help accomplish this um, and has been recently reintroduced. Um, so take a look at that if you have a chance. And um, another option for dealing with grazing and wilderness is getting the agencies to interpret the congressional grazing guidelines more narrowly and as they were intended. Um, Western Watersheds Project and Wilderness Watch and many other groups signed on to a letter to the Biden administration providing guidance for this and specifically requesting this. Um, and you can find more information about that at the links uh, that I've provided there. And then lastly, at some point in the future, Congress could revisit the congressional grazing guidelines, which are now over 40 years old. Um, they could issue better guidelines and updated guidelines that better reflect what we know now about the ecological impacts of grazing uh, and the climate impacts of grazing. And all of those things could be done um, fairly easily and with enough public support um, to protect wilderness from grazing. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of links there for additional information uh, if anybody wants more background on any of these issues. And with that, I will hand it back to our host for our next panelist. Okay, thanks, Dana. Next, we have Cindy Toole, the Arizona New Mexico Director with Western Watersheds Project. And her presentation is called Stories from the Southwest, Grazing Impacts on Wilderness from the Arizona Strip to the Gila National Forest. Over to you, Cindy. Okay. Forgot to turn on the video with me. I'm attempting to share my screen right now. So let me know if that shows up for you. Are you all seeing the first slide not, there? Not yet. Okay. How about now? Oh, there we go. Okay, it looks good. Okay, you're not seeing the note slide, I hope. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you. Uh, my name is Cindy Toole. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Arizona and New Mexico Director for Western Watersheds Project, and I'm an attorney. I live in Tucson, Arizona, which has been continuously occupied by people for over 10,000 years. It's also called Chukshon, and it's on the land of the Tono Atom people, as well as the Pascuayaki or Uemi people. So I'm showing you here a map of Arizona, New Mexico that also shows the indigenous lands. Arizona has 22 federally recognized tribes. New Mexico has three tribes and 19 pueblos. These lands include the Tono Atom Nation, the Hopi Nation, the Hickory Apache Nation, and the Navajo Nation, and those are all sovereign nations. I'm saying this in recognition that the lands I work and live on are the homelands of uh, people who've lived here for many, many generations, and also in recognition of the fact that the lands we're talking about today, designated wilderness areas, have a history of displacement of many of these indigenous people. And I encourage folks to kind of recognize that this history of displacement exists with me as we discuss how people today are impacting wilderness areas. Um, so here's a map of wilderness areas in New Mexico and Arizona. They show up in the darker green color. Both states have wilderness areas managed by the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the Bureau of Land Management. Arizona has more than 90 designated wilderness areas, covering more than four and a half million acres, while New Mexico has just 2% of, of its land designated as federal wilderness, and that's the smallest amount of any state. Um, in 2019, there were 13 new wilderness areas designated in New Mexico. <clears throat> 
So this is a slightly larger version of that map in Arizona and New Mexico. And again, you can just see the darker areas are the designated wilderness areas. And this is that same map of wilderness areas overlaid with Bureau of Land Management Livestock Grazing Allotments, and that's in the light orange or peach color, where um, grazing allotments overlap with wilderness areas, the green wilderness areas get a little bit darker. And so here, this is the, again, the same map, but this shows Forest Service grazing allotments. And again, the, the darker green is where the two overlap. Um, and as you can see, a large portion of the wilderness areas in Arizona and New Mexico are also authorized for livestock grazing, or they're surrounded by grazing allotments. There are a few places where grazing doesn't, is not authorized in wilderness areas. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but kind of in the middle of the screen, there's a light green blob. That's the Gila wilderness. Um, and so supposedly livestock grazing is not occurring there, but we know for certain that trespass livestock grazing in the Gila is occurring, and that is what I'm going to talk about next. So the Gila National Forest, uh, the, sorry, the Gila Wilderness is located in the Gila National Forest, just north of Silver City, New Mexico. And you may have heard, of, especially recently, about the problem of feral livestock in the Gila Wilderness and the Forest Service's plans to remove them. The feral livestock have been impacting natural resources in the Gila since the early 1990s when nearby allotments were left unused because the permittee at the time realized he just couldn't keep his cows on the designated allotment. He just gave up and walked away from his cows and the allotment and the permit. Since that time, the cows have been breeding, trampling riparian areas, chasing and harassing human wilderness visitors, and generally degrading the habitat of the wildlife that should have been protected within the wilderness area. Since 1998, the Forest Service has removed over 640 feral cows from the Gila in eight separate roundups. The Forest Service's prior efforts to remove the feral cows also included a $1,000 per head bounty for live feral cows removed from the area, and they offered $500 for a dead cow, which was removed. That was largely unsuccessful. The Forest Service has spent about $300,000 uh, paid to five different private contractors to gather and herd the cows out of the area. This effort was also unsuccessful. Um, the last contractor managed to rope and remove just 65 cows over a two-year period. Um, all told, contractors removed about 220 cows, and one of those cows, just one, had any indication it was not feral, and I think that it had a brand on it. So um, at least 250 cows were known to be in the area as of November of last year, and the Forest Service did a roundup. That uh, roundup last year required a closure order issued by the Forest Service to protect the public from the dangers of the removal effort and from the livestock themselves. And after that roundup, there were about 200 cows left. Um, so very recently, um, in February, the Forest Service announced their plan to kill the feral cows in the Gila wilderness using sharpshooters from Wildlife Services Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, also known as APHIS and they were gonna shoot the cows from helicopters in the wilderness area. Um, that plan was pretty controversial. It made the New York Times in a story that was published February 9th. Um, and these most recent removal efforts, both in November of 21 and this year, followed a lawsuit and a settlement agreement between the Center for Biological Diversity and the Forest Service, wherein the Forest Service agreed to monitor the areas where livestock were not authorized and to remove those unauthorized cows at least twice per year. And so they were doing that in the Gila wilderness. Um, their most recent plan to use helicopters was to kill about 200 head of feral cows roaming in the wilderness. And the result of the first effort was that APHIS staff killed about 47 cows the first day. This call took place over the objections of the New Mexico Cattle Growers Association and the New Mexico Livestock Board, who said they should have been allowed to go in and round up the livestock, and they worried that branded cows might be removed. Um, the Cattle Growers and Livestock Board claimed they hadn't had enough time to gather these cows that have been roaming and reproducing in the Gila for the past several decades. Um, and this has been an ongoing problem that everyone knew about, but they said that they didn't know that uh, this was an opportunity for them, and they had apparently been unaware of the financial incentives to, that the Forest Service had offered in the past. So how is this bad for wilderness? Um, well, first, just a few cows in a riparian area can do significant damage. And here, there are at least 200 cows, and the cows have been in there since the 90s. The riparian areas damaged by the feral livestock includes the Pio Creek and the Gila River. Um, cows contribute E. coli contamination because they defecate in and near the riparian areas. That puts recreational users at risk. The livestock hoof action degrades banks, increases sedimentation, 
that harmed native fish and other aquatic species, and the wildlife were forced to compete for forage where land and wildlife managers are not managing for that threat. Excuse me. The other impact to this wilderness for this removal effort is that helicopters were used flying really low over the wilderness area, and that's a degradation of the wilderness values and also a violation of the Wilderness Act. The Forest Service submitted something called a Minimum Requirements Decision Guide to the Regional Forest Service, which he approved, and that allowed the helicopters to fly lower than 2,000 feet above the ground, and that's how federal land managers get away with legally violating the Wilderness Act. They submit a checklist called a Minimum Requirements Decision Guide. So there's also a cost to these removal efforts. The recent project was $40,000 for at least two removal operations in 2022. They've done one, and you may soon see uh, helicopters return to the Gila wilderness. So uh, moving over to Arizona, there are two areas I want to talk about. Paiute Wilderness, which is in northwestern Arizona on the Arizona Strip, and the Mazatzal Wilderness area near Phoenix, which is managed by the Forest Service. The, I want to talk about the Mazatzals first, in case I run out of time. <laughs> The Mazatzal Wilderness Area is over 252,000 acres. It's located on both the Tonto and Coconino National Forests. It was established in 1940 and expanded to its present size in 1984. The vegetation type spans from pine forests all the way to Sonoran deserts. It ranges in elevation from just over 2,000 feet to nearly 8,000 feet, so it's pretty diverse. It also includes an extensive trail system, specifically a portion of the Arizona Trail, which was designated a National Scenic Trail. As you can see from the map to the right, that there, there are grazing allotments located covering the entire Mazatzal Wilderness area. In late 2018, the Forest Service um, notified some folks that they plan to use a bulldozer in the wilderness area to clean out and repair some stock tanks. A group that I work with here in Tucson called the Arizona Trail Association was informed about this plan and they talked to the Forest Service and let them know about their concerns to the Arizona Trail, which they uh, used and repaired quite often. Um, the Arizona Trail was, um, the association was especially concerned about the use of a track mounted bulldozer, which would significantly damage the Arizona Trail where it drove over it. They let the Forest Service know about their concerns. They also let the Forest Service know that the stock tanks in question weren't of any benefit to recreational users or equestrians. Um, and then in their conversation, the district ranger, her name was Debbie Kress, she served assured the um, Arizona Trail Association that there's plenty of time for the Forest Service to consider the recommendations and that the Forest Service absolutely did not want to negatively impact the Arizona Trail or its users, kind of didn't mention anything about the wilderness. Um, but at that time, the Forest Service made a promise that the association would be kept informed of the proposed work and they would reach out ahead of time before any work occurred. So jump forward to 2022, the Forest Service authorized the livestock grazing permittee to drive a bulldozer to do some work in the area of the Arizona Trail in the wilderness. The bulldozer project was approved by the range management specialist, the recreation and land staff, and the district ranger, Debbie Kress, again. So for some reason between 2018 and 2020, no action took place, but the Forest Service also failed to communicate with the Arizona Trail Association as promised. Um, as a result of the bulldozer work inside the Mazatzal Wilderness area, they did drive on a portion of the Arizona Trail and it was significantly damaged. This happened just days after the Arizona Trail Association and another group, the American Conservation Experience, did maintenance work on this same trail. This work was funded by a grant from the Arizona State Parks and Trails Maintenance Program. The seven miles of trail work that the groups did was done by hand and the people doing the work hiked into the area and completed the work over the course of two months. Some of them spent most of that two months camping out there. At the very end of this trail maintenance work, the young folks who'd gone to all this effort to do this trail work in the wilderness area, um, they actually saw the bulldozer driving over part of the work that they had completed. They went back later and they documented damage to almost two miles of the trail. And the map you see on the right is, the red line is the bulldozer route in the wilderness area. So this is a map of the project area and up towards the middle center top of the map is the Poles Mesa, that's the allotment. And you can see the Verde River, which is towards the bottom and kind of snakes up towards the right. And that comes along the white line, which is the Arizona Trail. So this is that same map and it shows the location of the three stock tanks. There's the red tank on the left, middle Poles tank towards the bottom middle and the West Poles tank 
on the, the far left. Um, and so these are satellite photos of those stock tanks. And you can see uh, the size of them in the picture that you're seeing right now in the middle. There's some cows next to the stock tank. And that's the West Poles Mesa tank. Um, the Forest Service claimed that these tanks were breached and had become silted so they didn't hold enough water and that they required the use of a bulldozer driving 17 and a half miles into the wilderness plus cost country driving on a historic dozer route which doesn't appear on the satellite imagery that was supposed to be flagged for visibility. The Forest Service claims in the Minimum Requirements Decision Guide that the livestock grazing was a valid existing right and that the impacts of the proposed motorized use would be thoroughly analyzed and that the use of the bulldozer to clean out the tanks was necessary to preserve a natural quality of wilderness character. But the real reason was made clear when we reviewed some FOIA documents and we saw that the Forest Service stated the use of the dozer to clean and repair these tanks is necessary in order to complete the work in a cost effective manner. The Forest Service also claimed the action was needed to provide reliable water for equestrians and wildlife that would enhance the recreational experience, but we know that they had already been told that was not accurate. So a couple of important details. The permittee, Jared Lyman, he's the current permittee. He's with Lyman Ranches. He sought funding to pay for the bulldozers to clean the stock tanks on this area before he had actually obtained the grazing permit from the prior permittee. Another thing was that the Caterpillar uh, bulldozer used to complete this work authorized was a D5 dozer. Um, so the Forest Service had indicated that they would only authorize a size D4 or smaller, and the use of a D5 is significant because a D4 only weighs about 29,000 pounds, while a D5 weighs over 42,000 pounds and is significantly larger. We also believe that helicopters were used to fly water in to fill one of the tanks. So the most significant impacts to the damage and the drainage structures that it's damage to the drainage structures that were recently built by the Arizona Trail Association and the grading that the trail of, of the trail by the bulldozer. The heavy equipment driving back and forth along the trail damaged it and where it dropped its blade, it pushed rock piles to the sides. Um, and that's now going to create an erosion channel and direct all water to flow down the middle of the trail. This excuse me, contributes significantly to erosion. And this is exactly the same location and the same reason why the Arizona Trail Association and the Conservation Corps did the work late last year. That work was completely compromised. And obviously, had there been better communication with the Forest Service, the Conservation Corps could have agreed to come out and do the work after the bulldozer left the area. Um, and that would have also meant that the Forest Service would have complied with not only the Wilderness Act, perhaps, but definitely with the National Environmental Policy Act. So, uh, the American Conservation Experience and Trail Association went back. They completed over a thousand hours of work over 16 days to repair the damaged trail. And it's really unfortunate because these hours could have been better spent on other sections of trail um, in other areas, preventing erosion, improving in recreational experiences elsewhere, especially in areas damaged by recent fires. But instead, they had to go and do this. The permittee was not charged for this work or for any of the damage that he did. And in fact, money was moved from the recreational fund in the Tonto National Forest to the grazing, um, grazing department so that they could help pay for some of this work. So beyond the destruction of the Arizona Trail, how does this hurt wilderness? Well, these stock tanks re require repeated maintenance. And so the authorization of this use just um, entrenches the use of livestock grazing and that repeated mechanized use of uh, bulldozers in wilderness. And it's clear this area is apparently unsuited for wild livestock use in its natural state. And it, the way this happened really entrenches the fact that land managers have a really failed understanding of the Wilderness Act, National Environmental Policy Act, as well as the Administrative Procedures Act, and potentially National Historic Preservation Act. This area is uh, one of the most culturally rich areas in the Tonto National Forest. Also, the Forest Service had alternatives. They could have used a mechanical scraper pulled by livestock, but that was determined to be too difficult because it was expensive and time consuming. Um, and they also could have chosen to just remove livestock from the area. So finally, moving on to um, the Paiute Wilderness. Um, that's in Bureau of Land Management Landage, Managed Lands. It's in the Arizona Strip Field Office. It's 87,900 acres, and it was designated in 1984. Most folks uh, get to this wilderness area from either St. George, Utah or Mesquite, Nevada. 
and uh, the southern portion of it lies within the Grand Canyon Parachute National Monument. The map you're seeing shows the Paiute Wilderness areas, um, and that one's south of I-15, which you can see here, if you can see my cursor. There's another wilderness area north of I-15. I'm just going to be talking about this one here. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about Sullivan Canyon allotment, which is in the middle section of the area outlined in red. So the Bureau of Land Management wanted to um, install a bunch of livestock infrastructure in partnership with the permittees for this allotment, Duane and Ivana Magoon. Um, the allotment is 21,000 acres, a little bit more. It includes all of Sullivan Canyon and a portion of Black Rock Mountain. It ranges in elevation from 2,000 feet to 7,600 feet. It's steep and um, the Bureau of Land Management describes it as having many natural barriers to livestock movement. The existing tank, troughs, and corral were authorized in 1938. They've been replaced or repaired a couple of times. But the Bureau of Land Management wants to bring this area, this wilderness area, into the modern age by installing a new 4,500 gallon storage tank, a pump, a pump tank, eight solar panels, and about 5,000 feet of new pop pipeline to move water around the allotment, which otherwise is really unsuitable for livestock use. The water is going to have to move about 800 feet uphill. That's the need for the solar pump and solar panels. Um, so we found out about this problem, this project, and with our allies, Grand Canyon Trust and Sierra Club, Grand Canyon Chapter and the Wilderness Watch, we submitted scoping comments just about two weeks ago. We pointed out the likely violations of the Wilderness Act with the grazing infrastructure that's going to industrialize this natural area, and it's going to result in a landscape dominated by the permanent works of man, degrading the primeval character of natural conditions. Um, so we also pointed out that the BLM's planned use of something called the Paiute Trail for bulldozer use and repeated maintenance was not appropriate. The BLM called it a road. We think that that might have been a violation of the Wilderness Act that's already occurred. Um, none of this infrastructure will enhance the wilderness character, and it's going to degrade the area significantly. So um, I'm out of time, and I'm just going to show you a couple pictures of this area. This is from the Grand Canyon Parish Hunt National Monument portion of the allotment. And that's going to do it for me. Thanks, Cindy. Some of those violations are just egregious down there. So next on to Gary McFarlane, the Ecosystems Defense Director with Friends of the Clearwater. His presentation is called Wilderness Cowed and Sheeped in the Rockies. Over to you, Gary. Well, thank you. And I am going to uh, reach in here and try to share my screen. So, let's see if this works. All right. That's well, good. this is a wilderness in the Northern Rockies, just to start off with it. And if you look how beautiful that little meander is down there, you could probably guess that this area is not grazed by cattle or sheep, and it is not. I took a little bit of liberty with drawing the boundaries of the, what I would call the Northern Rockies. Um, some people say I stretch it a little far, and there are some that say, well, even Northwest, much of Northwest Wyoming is not within it, but it generally includes uh, the mountainous regions of Idaho, uh, Western Montana, Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington. I include most of the blues, but not the Ochoco National Forest, Ochocoa, I, I should say. And I took a little bit of liberty and to grab an area in Northeastern Utah that I know quite well because I'm a Utah boy by birth. And it ecologically is more similar to the mountain ranges in Wyoming, like the Wind Rivers and the Grovants, uh, and that's the Uinta Mountains. So that's how I'm defining that part of the world here. And to look at some of the wilderness in the Northern Rockies, a um, couple places here, some of you may guess those areas. And one of the reasons that people love the wilderness of the Northern Rockies, um, it's wildlife. Well, the way I drew the boundary, there are about 40 separate areas designated as wilderness. 
13 have no grazing of cattle or sheep in them. So that seems quite a, uh, quite a few areas compared to the overall number, just a few areas. And why is that? Well, uh, Dana explained that in her presentation about the Wilderness Act. And there's uh, some areas though that are technically not grazed by domestic cattle or sheep, but they still have cattle or sheep in them because the allotment boundaries go up to their boundary. So with that, I'm gonna do a little quiz here and you don't have to answer obviously, uh, but I just want you to th think about these questions. These are all wilderness, wildernesses that I said are in the Northern Rockies. Which ones are not grazed? See if you can get, guess the ones that are not grazed of those on there. And then we'll move along here. So there's put up about eight of them. And that's not, of course, not all the areas, but. Well, and I'm glad that Adam put up that map at the first. Because those are the three on that list that are not grazed. But now why do I put an asterisk by the Teton wilderness? Because it has vacant allotments that could be grazed. All right, and here's an area that was fairly recently designated as wilderness uh, in the Boulder White Clouds wilderness legislation. About 12 million acres are within that area that I drew the bounds of the Northern Rockies that are designated as wilderness. Um, about one and a quarter million acres are within allotments and slightly over a million of those acres are grazed. And that's when this data was collected in about 2016. There are about 63,000 animal unit months within that uh, boundary that I drew of grazing that is uh, allowed to occur. And that does not include the areas that are potentially vacant allotments. So let's drill down into an area here on the Nez Perce and Clearwater National Forest. Nez Perce National Forest was named after uh, the Nez Perce tribe or Nez Perce in French. Uh, they call themselves the Nimipu and it's part of their traditional homeland. These are both forests that have anadromous fish that go to go to the ocean and come back, uh, salmon and steelhead. And this is the northern half of those two recently combined for administrative purposes, national forests. You can see the grazing allotments. They have active ones and then vacant ones. Uh, most of them are on the western part of this northern half of these two national forests. It's also true here, um, ma mainly in the west uh, on the southern part. This is mainly uh, showing uh, Nez Perce National Forest portion of the two recently combined. If you look there, you can see um, that the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness doesn't have any grazing in it. Um, the Frank Church River of No Return, at least in this part, has a vacant allotment. There are some allotments further south uh, that are active in that wilderness. But there are some allotments within uh, the uh, uh, Gospel Hump Wilderness. So we're drilling down here. And this is a bulk of the missionary for the organization that I currently work for. And there haven't been any allotment management plan revisions for decades in, in wilderness. And in fact, in neither of these two national forests except uh, uh, for a couple of three exceptions. And that's due to the 1995 Recessions Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's a nice shot from the Gospel Hump. And if we look at the map here, Gospel Hump was, Wilderness was designated in 1978. Uh, was a much larger roadless area at the time, and there's still some of that remaining. Uh, some of the impacts in the wilderness were from some past mining exploration in part of the area. Uh, 
206,000 acres of wilderness and about 35,000 acres of graze and a couple of grazing allotments in all. In all, and there's a little section of one vacant allotment that uh, is in within the wilderness that is not currently being grazed. So as we enter the Gospel Hump Wilderness, just uh, actually before you get there, you also see a sign, and this is within the allotment. Stock driveway. Well, uh, that's how they used to drive the, the sheep and the cattle historically, and it's still used to this day. Um, Slate Lake is six miles to be grazed within the allotment. Here's Slate Lake. Friends of the Clearwater did some monitoring in, uh, uh, in these allotments and I'll spare you most of the cowed out uh, photos because I took them and they're not all of that great of quality. But we found several problems. Uh, one was this it just looks like a piece of plywood, which it is, but it was supposed to be the livestock barrier to divide two parts of the allotment when they were supposed to graze at different times according to their annual operating uh, instructions or annual operating plan. Salt blocks were located right next to Slate Creek. And this is what the, uh, again, the uh, barrier looks like without, you know, without being put up. The trail is very wide as a result of a livestock grazing because it is, quote, a, unquote, a stock driveway, and this is the case being cattle. And the Forest Service responded by admitting that use in the meadows exceeded uh, what is allowed, and that stream bank disturbance uh, on Slate Creek was excessive in fact, not as much as it could be, and that uh, cattle numbers in a couple of years were in excess of what was per hit permitted in some years. But they said things will get better and uh, we will make sure we change things in the, ne in the next year's annual operating plan. Well, what can citizens do? This is another shot of the gospel, huh? Um, the 1984 allotment management plan won't be updated anytime soon. There's hardly any Forest Service range staff. Citizens have few, if any, handles because no decisions are being made except for the annual operating plan. And problems from challenging an annual operating plan are that they're only for one year. And by the time you may might be able to go, get into court if you can and call that a decision, that operating plan will be finished and done with. So there are some significant problems, even though much of the Northern Rockies uh, is not grazed by livestock, many of the wildernesses are not. And the ones that are generally only a small portion of them are grazed. Uh, there are still significant problems. And one other sort of unique little factor here about some of the Northern Rockies is that there is one, a lot, one wilderness in here that is grazed and it's administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and that's a Red Rocks Lake. They allow cattle, it was a kind of a traditional use. And ostensibly, the Fish and Wildlife Service justifies it up as a way to protect habitat for trumpeter swans. I think it's kind of bizarre, but that's the reason they give for allowing grazing inside the Red Rocks Lake Wilderness in the Red Rocks Lake National Wildlife Refuge. So I'm gonna shift gears here just a little bit now and go to sort of the adopted area that I kind of pulled into this definition of the Northern Rockies. And that's the Hyuannis Wilderness. I've spent many nights in this wilderness and uh, my first trip I took there as a young boy eight or nine years old with my father. And we went to one of the areas that didn't happen to be grazed by domestic livestock, which is probably good at the time. And that was in the mid 
early to mid 1960s. So there's about 456,000 acres in the High Uintas wilderness. It has a distinction of being perhaps the most heavily grazed wilderness in the entire National Wilderness Preservation System. And that's true in terms of acreage grazed. It's about 260,000 acres that are grazed. And this map here shows the allotments. Um, the green areas are places that are not allotted or are closed allotments. The yellow, or the, I guess the tan areas, the lighter areas are uh, sheep allotments. And then the darker reddish areas are uh, cattle allotments. And there's one allotment in there called Fall Creek, which is in kind of a strange uh, non-use non category and has been for um, many, many years. And it's because uh, the Ute tribe doesn't want to graze it. I think they're just uh, keeping a hold of it so it doesn't become grazed. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's the high unit wilderness. Um, it has about 16,000 animal unit months of grazing within it. And the only other one that's sort of close to it in terms of actual animal unit months is one that Cindy talked about, and that's the Mazatzal wilderness. And it's pretty close. And I guess depending on um, the year, that one might actually have uh, more grazing, depending also if some of the vacant allotments that were at least in 2016 in that wilderness uh, have been reissued. And I don't have information about that one way or the other. So some of the big issues here are bighorn sheep, cattle in riparian areas, erosion from both uh, classes of livestock, predator control, water quality, of course, recreation con conflicts. I want to give a shout out here because some of these that are going to follow, uh, these slides are going to follow, come from um, the Wild Utah Project at John Carter um, of Yellowstone to you in his connection. Dr. Carter has done a yeoman's effort here in monitoring and putting out papers about grazing. And this is based on a paper entitled Spatial Analysis of Livestock Grazing and Forest Service Management in the High Uintas Wilderness, Utah. It appeared in the Journal of Geographic Information Systems in 2020. And it goes to show some very important things. Number one, that the amount of grazing that takes place is well in excess of what should be done up here because the Forest Service has misidentified what is actually suitable for grazing um, by a factor of 10 or more times, depending on um, how one decides to slice and dice that. Okay. So this is a erosion you see on the left and these fork of blacks fork in the high unit wilderness uh, that are grazed by sheep. And there's so many of them and you've got so, this kind of erosion that takes place uh, in some places you see pretty significant pedestaline. You can see uh, some of the barren uplands and the braided stream channel uh, that is due in part to excessive uh, sheep use in some of this very high alpine country. High Uintas have some of the most extensive alpine in the lower 48 states. They're the highest mountain range in Utah. They, they trend east and west, and they have uh, several peaks in between 13 and 14,000 feet in elevation. This is an area, and this is in a sheep allotment. Uh, the sort of uh, common wisdom is that sheep allotments don't cause impacts to um, riparian areas, but uh, because of the damage into the upper watershed, you see a lot of head cutting here. This is in the East Fork of Black Fork again. Contrast that with this slide uh, in an area that is not grazed further east in the Beaver, uh, Beaver Creek drainage. And it hasn't been grazed now for about, let's see, it was in the early, 19, early to mid 1980s when those vacants became, uh, when these allotments became vacant. So I guess you can do the math, probably 35 years or more. And some other uh, photos that he has here showing some areas that have been rested again for 30 years, now about 35, no rest. 
uh, some cattle allotments, uh, stream bank damage, again, in some of the barren uplands uh, caused by, believe it or not, sheep. There's some other issues here I wish to address about the high Uintas. There's also been trespass cattle use in some of those areas that are not allotted to um, domestic livestock grazing that have been documented by uh, Yellowstone to Uintas connection uh, and uh, Dr. Carter and uh, Jason Christensen. There's a livestock driveway up to Black's Fork in both the West Fork and the East Fork of Black's Fork, and that caused considerable damage. It was a sacrifice area, and, and it still is a sacrifice area. There's been very little change to mitigate the damage. There's been some, but that was an area that the Forest Service realized was a problem back in the 1980s when I was living in Utah and arguing with the Forest Service about what needed to be done in the high humans wilderness, and still very little um, a change has been made. Although Leopold commented on the problem of grazing in the Uintas way back, recognizing that it's probably the only place in Utah that could support grizzly bears, yet sheep were being uh, given uh, preference even back then in what was uh, the, the then high Uintas primitive area. So with that, I will uh, cut it short. And if you want more information, uh, some information there, and if you have more information about the UNAs in particular, especially in later years, it's been uh, probably close to 30 years since I've spent much time in the UNA mountains now that I live in Northern Idaho, uh, Yellowstone, uh, uintas.org, you can reach them there as well. So thanks. Hey, thanks, Gary. Before we jump into the Q&A section of this event, I'd like to ask that you consider supporting the three groups represented here this evening and the important work that they do in defense of our public lands and wildlife. To make a donation, please visit westernwatersheds.org, wildernesswatch.org, and friendsoftheclearwater.org. Okay, so keep those questions coming in the chat. Uh, please keep your mics on mute. This is just going to be um, we're just going to have Patrick read them, uh, read them aloud. So Patrick, why don't you start with the first question? Okay. Thanks, Adam. And thank you, Dana, Gary, and Cindy for some great presentations. Let's see. So I'll start with some questions that came in for Dana. Um, who decides whether livestock should or can graze in wilderness areas? Good question. Um, a lot of that is decided by grazing um, that was already occurring in the wilderness areas at the time they were designated. So that dictates the number um, of cows uh, that are allowed to graze there. But as far as the individual permittees, that is up to um, the agencies and there's an application process for permits in designated wilderness. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure who asked that. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Um, so yeah, not, just to be clear, like all these, these questions for all three of you, obviously, if you, anybody wants to chime in. Um, let's see, go on to the next one here. Are any of the animals that get permits for grazing native to the habitat? Not usually, they're usually cows and uh, domestic sheep, which are not native. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I'm not aware of any, at least in wilderness, any native animal allotments, no. Not either. So there, there was a question about bison grazing, I think might've been connected to that. Um, has there been any uh, proposals otherwise, or otherwise to uh, graze bison in wilderness? I'm not aware of any, uh, but there is an issue with the bison that are, I guess, commercially raised. They're not, um, they have some um, cow or cattle genetics in them, even though they're in a separate uh, genera, according to the taxonomists. 
Uh, the only uh, pure bison herds are those found in Yellowstone and, and herds um, like the one up uh, on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. Um, and any bison that have been um, reintroduced to places from those herds like the Henry Mountains in Utah. So, uh, and there may be a few other places, but those are the only ones in the United States. I'm not speaking about Wood Buffalo National Park in uh, Canada that have uh, pure bison genetics. Uh, when you buy bison burgers and see bison on ranches, those are generally um, mixed uh, between cattle and bison genes. This is Cindy um, in Northern Arizona on something called the House Rock Wild Wildlife Area. The Arizona Game and Fish Department is right now scoping a project to expand an area where um, bison are being held and grazed. It's really a lot like uh, livestock grazing. I think part of the area they want to expand into is a wilderness area. You'd have to double check that, but it's very near a wilderness area if it's not in it. And the problem with bison um, in Arizona especially is, and as Gary mentioned, they're, they're bison-cow hybrids. They're called beefalo, so they graze very differently than a native bison would. And they also, whether they're beefalo or pure bison, they're not very prone to respecting fences, even less so than uh, cows are. So if you're trying to graze bison in an area, they're just not going to stay where you want them to stay. Hey, thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Gary. So next question, uh, has I, the Biden... Has can the Biden I respond been... on the bison? In Maryland, we have bison ranches where we have a natural density and it turns out it's perfect for the native ecosystem. They're used to the way bison graze as opposed to cattle. Any grass, switchgrass, grass, by by weed, loose stem and so forth. And if they have, if the natural, if, the, if there's too many bison, they harvest more. If there's less, they harvest less. And they, they've been certified by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So that. Okay, sorry, Mark, we're gonna have to mute you. Um, if people could please keep their mics muted um, and be respectful of people who have their questions and thank you. Okay, uh, let's try that again. So has the Biden administration expressed interest in requiring BLM and Forest Service to reduce grazing on wilderness land? They, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. They have been open to conversations with us, um, but we have not seen a lot of movement on the Biden administration's end um, as far as closing or reducing um, allotments in wilderness. And I will note that one of the other things that's related to that is we, as most people probably know, have been experiencing, experiencing a significant drought. And we've also had a sign on letter to the Biden administration to take actions to reduce grazing um, nationwide, but particularly in wilderness uh, as well um, to address the drought situation on the ground. And we've not seen a lot of movement on that either. I would say probably most of the interest that we've seen has come from um, Congress on those issues and not the Biden administration. I don't know, Gary, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, thanks, Dana. Uh, next one, uh, this I guess it'd be for everybody. So waters in wilderness areas have some of the most stringent water quality standards. The violations of the water quality standards for E. coli and nutrients have been used to contest grazing permits in wilderness areas. This is Cindy. Um, I, I did mention uh, E. coli issues. I'm not sure that there have been any challenges specifically in wilderness areas, but we have raised issues related to um, water quality violations with E. coli in other areas, um, especially down here in Arizona and the San Pedro River. I'm aware that there may be some efforts in Northern California, both within and outside of wilderness to do the same, though I don't know if they've come to fruition yet. And those standards are really important because as I mentioned before, the congressional grazing guidelines say that you can't reduce 
or limit grazing in wilderness solely because an area has been designated as wilderness. So all those other standards like water quality st standards, soil standards, um, impacts to wildlife are incredibly important in wilderness. Um, and we generally challenge those when we're also challenging grazing permits in wilderness as well. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, next one, this is another Biden administration question. Uh, could Biden issue an executive order halting grazing in designated, designated wilderness areas? I don't think that would, I think that would be a politically very bad decision. Um, I'm not sure if he could or not. Um, the reality of that happening, I think, or the chances of that happening, I think are extremely low. Ann Wheat, can you please unshare your screen? Thank you. Okay, moving on. I will add one thing to that. Um, sure. Something that the Biden administration could do um, in wilderness that would be a bit more narrow than that would be issuing an executive order to close the vacant allotments. Um, that are not permitted to anybody, to any individual, and have been vacant for, you know, probably five to 10 years, a lot of them. Um, so there may be some narrower avenues for issuing executive orders um, that could get at some of the issues in wilderness. And now that you mentioned uh, vacant allotments, Dana, there's a, a question related to that. Um, is there a NEPA process involved in if the agents in agency were to reopen a vacant allotment? What does that process look like? Gary, you might know the answer to that question better than I um, would. It, it, they usually have to do NEPA. And it also might depend on what the forest plan or the BLM resource management plan say about that vacant allotment. Uh, that might determine the level of analysis. Usually we've seen discussions around environmental assessments in vacant allotments and wilderness on the national forest system. Um, and I believe would probably be the same for the Bureau of Land Management. Yes, um, so I challenged a decision from the Bureau of Land Management. This is Cindy. Um, I challenged their decision to try to use a categorical exclusion to reopen an allotment that had been vacant for about 30 years. Um, and that was a successful lawsuit and they are now proceeding with an environmental assessment to re try to reopen that allotment. Um, there should be some NEPA process, and I think Gary started his answer sort of with depends, and that's a standard lawyer answer, I guess, is that it does depend on the situation. How long has it been vacant? Why is it vacant? Um, did the permit expire? But generally, the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management both are just reauthorizing grazing permits on, on currently um, active allotments without any NEPA analysis at all, sometimes for more than 20 years. And Western Watersheds Project recently just put up a story map. I'll put a link in the chat um, where you can look at those allotments and check them out for yourself. Great, thank you, Cindy. Um, and for folks that have their hands raised, just please type your questions in the chat there and uh, I'll be happy to read them off. Um, we've got a pretty good question here Pretty pertinent. Uh, are grazed areas counted in uh, 30 by 30 initiative? Uh, I think that remains to be seen, but I think the indications are yes, because when they talk about farmlands and city parks uh, as potentially fitting in with the 30 by 30 initiative, yes. I don't think they should be, especially ones that have significant impacts, which would take out even part of the National Wilderness Preservation System. Um, there are, I think there are four categories of lands and it's been recommended, I think by USGS that only the first two would count as really protected and that includes wilderness national parks, wilderness study areas and national monuments. And I would suggest that they 
areas that are grazed probably ought not to be counted. And so I want to, I don't know if you all can see the picture behind me, my, my background. That's a national monument that is grazed. So if that were to be included as part of the 30 by 30, that seems clearly inappropriate. I mean, this entire allotment looks like this. It's totally degraded. This is in Arizona near Tucson. This is the Ironwood Forest National Monument. So it's a problem if they are counted in the 30 by 30. Okay, uh, moving on. So any way of eliminating the subsidies uh, for ranchers, I'm assuming this is uh, the low, low AUM rate. Um, most public grazing would not exist without it. I saw this as a US Forest Service manager. So can we eliminate the subsidies, I guess is the question. a constant conversation. <laughs> um, it's not something that we have gotten a lot of traction on, um, but it's something that we will continue to push um, in the future. I, I, I don't think that that's something that we're going to see in this um, administration and probably the next, but I think it's a, a worthy cause to keep pursuing. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to jump in on that one too. Stop me if I talk too much. Um, there's the subsidy of the dollar thirty-five per AUM, the rock bottom price that people pay. There's also subsidies for water infrastructure, for fencing, for things like that from the federal government. And there's also a whole host of subsidies from state governments, including state game and fish departments. Um, so those are really hard to keep track of and to make change on. But I think that is something that needs to be done. I'm going to put in the chat a link to a, a website that a gentleman here in Arizona is uh, created and he's tracking those state and federal level subsidies for grazing allotments in Arizona. Hey, thank you, Cindy. And I, you can't talk too much, so don't worry about that. <laughs> talk as much as you want. Um, so uh, are there fines for permit holders that violate the terms or regulations? I'll take a shot. In theory, yes. In practice, very rarely. Um, it's usually just a letter, a warning letter. Yeah, a lot of these permits that we're looking at have chronic violations of grazing permits and they're still permit holders. Um, so whatever the repercussions are for violating the permit is generally pretty small, um, including um, taking, uh, as the statute calls it, endangered species. Um, you, you can have some pretty egregious violations um, and still be a permit holder. And that's something that we've been seeing in a lot of areas too. Hey, Annette. This question, I think this person is uh, strategizing a bit, but can anybody hold a, uh, a grazing permit? And if so, do you have to graze it? Well, I'll take a shot at that since my degree way, way, way back was supposedly in range management. Uh, can anybody hold one? No, you need to have base property generally. Uh, so that is under the Taylor Grazing Act, which applies to both the national forest and system and, and the public lands administered by Bureau of Land Management. Um, so that's the short, the short answer. Um, and you have to use it. Yes, there's generally a use it or lose it provision, but that, that can also be affected by politics and or um, other circumstances and uh, for um, permitting convenience, but it's usually about three years, then you lose it if you don't grace for three years in a row. Hey, thanks, Gary. Uh, this is a big question, but uh, what potential do the presenters see for restoring the health of wilderness lands through collaboration with tribes, local communities, and recreationists? 
I think that's a really good question. This is Cindy. Um, I, I think it's a difficult question um, because recreational users don't really see, often see livestock as an impact that they're concerned about. Um, I think the exception that I've experienced firsthand is with the Arizona Trail Association. Their staff and volunteers and members actually got a firsthand look at why livestock grazing is a challenge for, for their use of the Forest Service. Um, I think there's lots of opportunities. I don't think that I personally haven't explored them very fully yet, and it's something I'm just starting to dive into. I think there was good cooperation between tribes and, and conservation interests on bighorn sheep issues in and around Hell's Canyon and the Salmon River, which uh, is the southern boundary of the Gospel Hump Wilderness. Um, and through some various planning processes and some lawsuits. So that's one that I think um, we could point to. Right, Gary, didn't that result in the closure of a, a few allotments as well? Yeah, it did on the Payette and also one on the Nez Perce, the last sheep allotment on the Nez Perce National Forest through lawsuits and, and cooperation. It was um, closed to sheep grazing and um, is currently closed and the Forest Service has recommended that it remain closed in the draft of the forest plan. Okay, let's get, a, let's get two more questions in. I wanna add just a, a really sort of general answer to that too. And that is the livestock industry and livestock interests um, have the ear of the agencies and they have the ear of the representatives. And so I think it's really important for the public generally, whether it's you know recreation interests or just an individual who's concerned about the health of the environment and the health of wilderness um, to get involved in a lot of the processes um, that are available as far as um, permit renewal, um, addressing concerns over permit violations, or just generally, you know, calling up representatives and expressing your concerns to them, or contacting agency officials and expressing your concern to them. They need to hear from us. Absolutely. Thanks, Dana. Um, I know some of you spoke to this in your slides about in terms of numbers and statistics, but someone's asking, um, how many actual cattle ranchers, uh, which I'm assuming are permittees, are we talking about in all wilderness grazing? Is it in the hundreds or in the thousands? I don't know the answer to that one. I don't either. I do know there are many allotments, I guess about probably a thousand allotments or thereabouts. I'd have to go back and do a count on some of the data that I have, but um, but there's some permittees that use more than one. You'll have a group of permittees using an allotment and you might have one permittee using several. So I really don't know. Okay, and someone that had a question about um, Point Reyes um, and why are cows being allowed to be grazed in a national seashore? I'm going to toss out tradition. Um, that seems to be what the Park Service is sort of leaning heavily on. It, it seems to be clearly in violation of the intent of the people who made the decisions years ago to remove the livestock and the, the I believe that the um, people who were grazing, grazing livestock on Point Reyes were paid in order to like in the short future remove their livestock and they just never did and the Park Service didn't enforce and then it's just an ingrained entrenched idea. Any more burning questions, Patrick, or are we good to wrap it up? No, I think we're pretty good to wrap it up. Um, thank you all three of you for answering some questions.
All right. Well, this has been a great webinar. Thanks so much, Cindy and Dana and Gary, Patrick. Thanks for your help tonight. And thanks to all of you for joining us. So stay tuned for more events. Have a good evening. <laughs>